All right, Romans chapter 11, you ready? Get your notes, get your pen. Everybody, let's go within and let's find out what Romans chapter 11 says. This book's been a real blessing, hasn't it? Have you learned anything? All right, let's put your eyes, or your hands over your eyes, and let's tell me about the chapters. <laughs> Come on, you, you, I know, I'm just joking with you. But read along. As we get through, the, finally we get through chapter 16, you'll be able to tell people what these things are about, why they were written, and the importance of them. Can you say amen? And those of you coming into the garage, welcome to Bible study. And I hope you sang a little bit with us. Maybe you didn't have the words, but hum along, make a joyful noise like Danny said. And so we welcome you too. So grab your notepads and your Bible and let's get into this. All right, we're going to be studying tonight in the book of Romans, chapter 11. So it's good to have you here to this evening. Tonight's teaching, Romans chapter 11. All right, so reading along in your notes real quickly because I got it in there fast. What's Romans chapter 1 about? What happens when humans reject God? Not a good thing. Two, don't be a religious bigot and don't judge other people. Amen? Because religious people feel they're getting somewhere through their works. So if they've worked really hard and they've actually gotten something done, it's easy to look down your nose that somebody hasn't done anything. So we want to be careful of that, doesn't it? Chapter 3 tells us what the problem is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, which in states chapter 4. We find out it's through faith that we believe in God. Can you say amen? And before the law, through Abraham's faith was considered righteous, and after the law, David's faith. Amen? So it tells us it doesn't matter where you're at in God's dispensations, faith pleases God, and if you put your faith in God, he declares you right. By faith. Okay? All right. Four, fifthly, tells us what happened. What's the fifth chapter of Romans about? The fall of man, huh? Right? And how sin entered man and death by sin. But the one act of Jesus Christ, the last Adam, redeemed us. Romans 6 teaches us to what? To die to ourself. To die to sin We're, and be alive unto God. So there's actually separation. You can meet with God first thing in the morning and live in the spirit the rest of the day. Or you could just get up in the morning, say hello, walk off into your physicalness. Amen. And you'll find that there's little drives and little things in your flesh that kind of pop up once in a while. God forbid. Chapter 7. We see that in chapter 7 as a Pharisee. Paul discovered that even when he wanted to do good, by following the law, evil was present with him. Chapter 8 teaches us, we broke it into, teaches us what happens. We are free through Jesus Christ from the curse of the law. Can you say amen? But also, we have, when we walk with Jesus, no weapon formed against us can prosper. Neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from that Walk with God's love. Can you say amen? Then, then we switched off. In the next, next 9, 10, and 11, Paul's heart goes out to his Roman, excuse me, to his Jewish brethren about how they rejected the gospel. Now, if you'll remember in teaching, in Matthew chapter 13, we see a separation right in Matthew 13, right when it starts in the chapter, that Jesus leaves the house and goes to the sea. And you say, well, what significance did that have? When Jesus left the house, that's when the Israelites rejected him as a nation, as the Messiah. So when the Lord is rejected, he goes to when he's accepted. So he left the house of Israel and goes and went, sat by the sea. And that's when he begins to teach the parables, right? Parable of the kingdom of the sower. And he goes on, several of those parables. But the sea represents the Gentiles. The house, the house of Israel, leaving the house because they rejected him, going to the sea to teach anybody that wants Messiah. He goes to the sea and he begins to teach. Can you say amen? 
Well, Romans 11 is going to be all about that. So we see in in chapter 9, Israel rejects. Follow along your notes here. We see the Israel's rejection of Christ Jesus, which served God's purpose, okay? So in chapter 9, by their rejection of Jesus, it opened it up to the Gentiles for us to receive him as our Savior, right? This grieved Paul's heart, Israel's fleshliness and pride quickened God's plan for us, the Gentiles. Then we move to chapter 10. We see Israel's problem. They had a zeal for God, but without according to knowledge. They went about seeking righteousness and establishing their own righteousness by their works. Are you with me? (coughs) Sorry about that. And now we come to chapter 11, point, right under your point there. We see Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ going on, and it worked for our good. How? Yet their rejection of Christ was not final. In other words, God did not finish his dealings with them. He says, okay, you're going to reject me? All right, I'm going to save a little time for you. Another seven years where I'm going to deal with you quite specifically, Israel. It's called the tribulation. And I'm going to finish my dealings with you. Okay? So he lets on about this in chapter 11. So let's finish the point. There was a remnant of the Jews which believed, but because of the pride of the rest, they rejected the gospel message of God And God will finally finish his dealings with Israel during the tribulation. We call it Jacob's trouble. Remember? Now, can you remember when Jacob had some real trouble when he was wrestling with the Lord? What happened to Jacob when he was wrestling with the Lord? He got his hip popped out of joint, didn't he? Amen. So when it says in the tribulation, going back to Jacob's trouble, God will really deal with the Israelites. We might have a few hips out of joint. You know what I mean? And dealing with them, how they rejected the Messiah. So you with me? So we are in what's called right now. Everyone, check this out. The times of the Gentiles. How many of you have ever heard that term? That happened, okay, when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and the Holy Spirit came down into the earth, the church was born. And that's the beginning of the, the time of the Gentiles, where God will reach out to anybody that will call upon the name of the Lord. And that the end of the time of Gentiles will stop at the rapture. Once we're raptured up, the time of grace or the time of the Gentiles ceases, and the earth goes back under the dispensation of the law again for seven years where God deals harshly. Angels do God's bidding again. The Holy Spirit's there, but it's very harsh. Remember the Old Testament? Ground opened, swallowed people. Hello? Mountains trembled. You know, things collapsed. For those seven years, it's going to be awful. First five years, Antichrist is going to come into power. Second three and a half years, which is called the Great Tribulation, The three bowls, the three trumpets, and the three uh, vials will be poured out. And all the curses, the Nephilim is going to come back. Creatures are going to come out of the Euphrates. And you and I are going to be watching in the 3D theater from heaven as all of this comes to pass. And then God says, saddle up. Saddle up your horses. Let's gonna ride. And we're going to ride with him as he consumes the Antichrist and his armies. Can you say amen? <clears throat> so Paul has all of this that he's trying to lay out. So we are in what's called the time of the Gentiles. All right. Our text is Galatians 3. You go to Romans 11. Let me read it to you. Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 12 gives us a little insight to the Cain and Abel works versus faith. Okay. For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse. So people that try to work hard to please God fall fall away from grace and under a curse. Why? 
because God hates everybody who does that? No. You, what do you have in your flesh? You have a curse. So whenever we do something from the work of flesh, even if it's intended to do well, if it's not under the guidance of the Spirit, under the guidance of your spirit, it's just a dead work. It's what it's called. You're just doing something, but it has no life in it. So smile at somebody across the table and say, stop doing that. <laughs> all right, bless your hearts, all right. But it says, listen, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. How many know if you break one law, you're guilty of them all? But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God's. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's you and I. And then a little farther down in verse 13 through 15 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us as it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. See, the time of the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise, the promise of eternal life, all the eternal equipment of God, the promise of the Spirit through faith. Woo! See, that's me. <coughs> all right, here we go. First point. <coughs> <coughs> Man, I got some water here. All right, Romans 11, verses 1 through 6. Now, some of the phrases I'm going to explain. So, if we, we have a funny phrase here, we'll explain. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down um, with God. Or excuse me. They have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I alone am left. Remember, he was sitting in the cave. And uh, the, pro, uh, the lady Jezebel said, you're going to be dead by tomorrow. So he runs over and gets in the cave after he kills all the prophets of Baal. Yeah, you know, I, I don't understand him because one minute he's victorious, the next minute some lady says, you're going to be dead. And he runs up and hides in the cave. But what God, it says, but what does the divine or what does God's response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, why is Paul bringing this up? Because even so then, at this present time, just like it was back in that time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. In other words, there are some Jewish people who really believe God. They're not trying to follow God by works. There's only a small amount of them. They're a remnant. But God's grace worked for them too. <clears throat> so a few were following God as Jewish people through the faith of Abraham. And the majority were trying to please God through their works. See how good we are? Let me pray a long prayer for you. This is how much I'm giving how much are you giving? You see? You see how that stuff works? They're getting the praise of men rather than the praise of God. And, of course, that's what religion does. So let's go on and read. Even so then, this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. All right, one, two, and three points. Number one, Paul was an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, born of the tribe of Benjamin. In fact, he was the head of his class. God does not throw away his people, but responds only to faith. So if somebody comes to God and says, I'm just going to make this up. God, I've been a faithful Sunday school worker for 40 years. 
you better bless me. Do you, now, look, look, I know that sounds obvious. But do you think God's going to reward me for 40 years if I have an attitude like that? No, because it's a, a work, isn't it? I'm presenting a work. Now, there is a time where works are important. But works should follow your faith in God. They should never go before your faith in God. What I mean is, is you're not working hard to get God to love you. God loves you, and so you love serving him. Now you're working, but it's more of a labor of love than you just got to get her done. Amen? And, of course, as good Bible students that you are, we found out that there's a lot of Christians, bless their heart, they're trying to be a strong Christian, but they're doing it in their own strength, which leads back to burnout and works. Okay, so avoid that if you can. Say amen. Two, Elijah didn't know until God told him there were 7,000 believers. He had let his unbelief cloud his mind. The woman, Jezebel, says, you're going to be dead tomorrow. He believed her. As a man picketh in his heart, so he can become. If you think it's all over with, God's done with you, your whole scenario is going to follow that kind of area. We don't want to do that. Can you say amen? And thirdly, <clears throat> point three. So just like then, there is now a Jewish remnant, even today, that believes in faith. Grace has reached out to them because they believed in God by faith, not works. Amen. Let's go to the next scripture. Uh, starting at verse 7, Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 11, verse 7. The Jews by works are blinded. Do you see? When we walk around in our flesh, there's a natural blinders. Even if we weren't you, in the flesh, there's certain things we can see, other things that we can't. What do you mean? How many's ever heard of the term peripheral vision? For example, you bought your car, remember? You bought your car. Never noticed those cars before, but you like that car. And now that you're driving that car, everybody has one. Yeah. It's in your peripheral vision. You see what I'm saying? If you're a person that's negative or th looks at a lot of negative things, if you're not careful, that's pretty soon all you're going to be able to notice is in your peripheral vision, the negatives. If you're a person that just loves God, God feeds you, encourages you in your peripheral vision, you're going to see the good in people. You see how it works. You know what I'm saying? Whatever you expose yourself over a period of time is going to affect you one way or another. We have Lot as an example. If somebody is so vexed by what he saw, it controlled him. He didn't have faith to get out of the town. God had to come rescue him because of the promise and the covenant that he had with Abraham. So let's go on past that. The Jews by works are blinded. So Romans 11, verse 7 and 8, listen. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Those Israelites, by works, haven't obtained what they need. But the elect that follow God by faith, even though they be Jews, obtained it. And the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor. Everyone say stupor. Say, that's short for stupid. <clears throat> Moving right along. I'm not calling anybody stupid. That's what the scripture says. You see it? It's like being drunk. They can't think clear. They're bumbling around. You know, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. This is up to this very day. Now, what happened? These are Israelites. God sends them a stupor. Now, remember Romans 1. They didn't need God. Remember, they were smart. And God turned them over to themselves. And they declared that they were wise, but they became fools. Hello? Well, same happens to anybody in the flesh. And when you're religious in the flesh, it will send you to a stupor. Now think about it. Doesn't it say over in Peter that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone? But it's a rock of stumbling to those that stumble at the word? He's talking about the Jewish people. Now, he's not putting Jewish people down, please. And if you're watching my camera, 
I love the Jewish nation and they're wonderful. But listen, all of us, religious or not in the flesh, we got blinders on. We got our fingers in our ears and we're running to destruction. God's constantly saying, let you have ears to hear. And when he did the parable of the sower, remember? He says that seeing they see not, hearing they hear not less. Any time that they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and I should heal them or convert them, then they will know. Satan blinds minds, doesn't he? So somebody walking on in the flesh, that's why Jesus is the blind leading the blind. They both will stumble into the ditch. All right, so let's go on. Okay, he gave me a spirit of stupor. All right, point one, two, and three, and four underneath that scripture. So number one, Israel has not obtained what it seeks. It seeks salvation, but it was not sought by faith. You can read that account also in Hebrews chapter four. Two, okay, the elect, the ones who believe by faith in God, have obtained it because it is revealed by the word in faith. Can you say amen? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Thirdly, the religious people were seeking God by their works. So they're walking around, pounding their chest and going, aren't we special? I'm just kind of hamming it up a bit, okay? And put, whom put them in an open stupor? When people think they're smart when they're not smart, doesn't it look like they're in a stupor? Hey, what do you think of that? And they just, it's just a mess. Hello, moving right along. Fourthly, they have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. Who do you think's behind that? Besides their flesh, Satan is. Because anytime they hear with, their, uh, hear with their ears, see with their eyes, right? Why? Because of religious pride. God resists the proud and gives grace to the... A, a haughty spirit cometh before a fall, and pride becomes for... Or I said it wrong. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In other words, so you get all huffy and puffy and you're going to have a bad time. All right, so let's look at this scripture for a minute underneath those points. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 18, I'll read rather quickly. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But... Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over the Jewish heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, whether Jew, Gentile, bond, or free, white, black, female, whatever, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, or a modern translation says freedom. We have freedom, but we all, with unveiled face, now we can focus on Christ, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory. You are that Polaroid camera. Focus on Jesus first thing in the morning. Get a good picture of what he thinks, what he knows about you, what he's doing with you, and then rise up in victory and go through your day. That's who you are. Plug your Phone in in the morning, get it fully charged for the day. Now, I'm being silly with you, but plug in, get fully charged for your day. God knows what that day's going to bring. So you might just need to stay another 10 minutes for an extra charge. A little more pressurizing. <clears throat> All right. My next point their rejection, a snare. How many of when you, when the light appeals to you and you turn away from the light, what's left? Darkness. Darkness. So when they rejected the light, they walk on in even though they want to see. See, what a deception the devil does to people. All right. So Romans 11 verse 9 and 10. 
And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their backs always. It says because of their silly pride, let their eyes not see. David's saying, let their eyes not see. I mean, they're giving them problems. Who crucified Jesus anyway? Was it the, the religious people? Mostly. Oh, bless your heart. So I hear you got religion. No. <laughs> Do I look that blind? Moving right along. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so, you see, people that walk on the flesh and they're religious, it doesn't matter, are just the flesh. We act like slaves to sin. So we, can't, we get so embarrassed, we have to turn our back on God because we don't want to turn. What does it say in the very end time when Jesus shows up? They'll say, rocks cover us. They'll fall on their face and, and cover themselves because of his glory. Here are a couple of points I want to give you. Number one, let them feast on their own works, okay, which will become a snare and a trap. You see, when a person's all into what they're doing, they haven't got time for anybody else what they're doing. And if a person wants to do it their way and they never consulted God, what if that's their way is not the way God wants it done? So they were focusing hard to do the wrong thing the right way or the right thing the wrong way. Hello. And so we can do, without God's guidance, we can, we surely can mess up. Anybody can, okay? So, it says, look, they're going to ignore God, so they're going to feast on their own works. They're going to become a snare and a trap. Two, their eyes will become darkened because they reject the truth, and the truth gives light. Remember he said, let your eyes be single. Be careful that the light that is in you be not darkness. Then how great will that be that darkness? You know? Then thirdly, they shall become unworthy as to bow their backs to God. Here's a funny thing. When God says any man praying or prophesying shouldn't feel ashamed to have his head covered. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pray with your hat on. What it's saying is back then, the people were taught that they were so unworthy all the time that they just felt the cover of the head in shame. And God says, look, lift up your face. I'd like to see your countenance. Hello. And then we see them wearing a little cap, running around in disobedience to God. And don't even know what they're doing, you see. Their eyes, even though they see, they see not. And though they hear, oh, they hear only what they conceive is the truth. It's kind of like the news media. <clears throat> Moving right along. <clears throat> All right. Israel's rejection of Christ is not final. Verse 11 through 15. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But though their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles because they were stubborn and full of pride. Thank God it came to us. Now, if their fall is riches for the world. By rejection of God, the world can receive Christ. And their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. If we're blessed because they rejected God, what's it going to be like when they accept God? It's really going to be good. You got the point? For I speak to you Gentiles, verse 13, insomuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh, Jewish people, and save some of them, for if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance of the Lord be but life from the dead. Amen? So it doesn't matter. Somebody says, you know, I believed wrong. I want Jesus. He is my Messiah. God accepts him, right? I mean, if you went to God and, and you said, God, 
I know all this, all this time I've been resisting you, but now, now I know it's the truth. Will you accept me? I, I surrender. And God says, no. It's not going to say that. Huh? Well, we get this idea. Oh, I failed God too many times. And God, when I come to him, he's going to say no. No, for heaven's sakes. Look, the only, the, the only thing you as a child of God need to be aware of is there are six things God asks you not to get involved in. We'll cover that some other time. And it literally lists the six things. They're not in, this is not the ones in Proverbs. Because it's six things, yeah, seventh is an abomination. This is completely six other things that are what I call the little foxes. We'll share that sometime with you. It's kind of interesting because it leads to so many other things that are so obvious, but these are hidden little things. We'll get to that later on. Okay, now, one, Israel's rejection of Christ will work for the world, right? Okay, and for the, us Gentiles. This brings salvation to us, too, okay? Paul asked the question, if their, their fall worked for us, how much more their restoration will bless everyone around the world, right? Just think of the millennial reign. Woohoo! You're going to have your glorified bodies. You're going to be teaching with Jesus for a thousand years. Better get your teeter, your teacher thing going. You know what I mean? I'm just teasing you. And then thirdly, we are privileged to be accepted in Christ, right? We're accepted in the beloved. Where there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, there's neither male nor female. God our Father only recognizes a believer who believes in faith. Now, he recognizes you're a woman, recognizes you're a man. But in faith, he doesn't see any division. The Jews over here, the Catholics over there, you Pentecostals way under a rock over there. You know what I mean? Come on, I'm joking. He recognizes a believer as being no respecter of persons. Can you say amen? All right, next point. God will remove... What section? Oh, sorry, I did? Okay. All right, Paul wants to provoke them to jealousy, okay? All right, so Romans eleven sixteen through 24. God grafts in those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, in the gospel, thank you. For in the gospel, all right, isn't there a scripture that says that we are grafted in as wild olive branches into the tree? Can you think where that might be? It's going to say it here, but I mean, John 15, maybe? You're the branches, he's the vine. But then it talks a little later on about how we being Gentiles because we're grafted in. Amen? We're adopted in Romans 8 as sons and daughters. And did you know an adopted child is treated just like a regular child, sometimes even better? All right, so let's go on. Romans verse 16 through 24. Sorry about that, everybody. God grafts in those who believe in Christ. For if the first fruit is holy... The lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, say juice, and, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. In other words, don't come against Jews, there are that olive tree, and you have been allowed in and grafted in by the grace of God. So don't speak against the Jews. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but in the root supports you. So don't boast that you're just wonderful. Remember, if it wasn't for the root, God, you wouldn't be in the plan. Can you say amen? Got that part? Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of the unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. 22, therefore consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who felt... Uh, 
<coughs> severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will also be cut. So if you don't be good, you're going to be cut off too. 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So here's the Jews, rejected God, and realized they made a mistake. God can graft them back in, can he? For if you were, verse 24, cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, these branches that were cut off, are who were natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. So in other words, don't be thinking, hey, those dumb Jews, you know, they did this, look at, now I'm saved. That would be this horrible thing to say. They're not dumb and they're not. They just rejected God because the enemy fixated their idea of works pleasing God instead of faith. All right, God will remove Israel's sin. When will God remove Israel's sin? Okay, right. He will do it during the tribulation. Point one. If as Gentiles, the gospel were preached to us through Israel's rejection of the gospel, and faith comes from hearing, and then we get born again, we are supernaturally then grafted into Christ, and the root, the Father. God changes us into the image of his Son. Two, don't speak against the broken branches. God is able to graft them back in through the truth of the gospel. Can you say amen? amen? And then thirdly, we are privileged to be accepted in Christ, where there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave, free, male, or female, God our Father only recognizes a believer who believes by faith. Then God will remove Israel's sin. Whew, sorry about that. All right. Chapter 11, verse 25 through 27. All right. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Because of Israel's rejection, we're saved. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness is in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. So all Israel will be saved, as is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Point one. Are you still with me? Good, we're doing good. All right, point one, Israel's time to be dealt with is when? Tribulation. <clears throat> yeah, tribulation. tribulation. Amen. After the times of the Gentiles is over. Two, it still must be by faith in God, not by works of our own righteousness or because they were Jewish. You see, some people believe we were God's grandfathered in. We brought forth Messiah, so automatically God just winks at our sin. Well, no, but there are people that believe that. How many times have you asked somebody, Hi, hey, are you a Christian? Well, I'm an American. And they don't mean anything by it. Nobody's ever taught them. There has to be a change within. There has to be a covering of the putridness of our flesh. And then finally, God's wisdom in, uh, excuse me, God's wisdom in and with mercy. Romans eleven twenty eight through 36. Concerning this gospel now, they were enemies for your sake. But now concerning the election, those that believe in faith, they were beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevo irrevocable. In other words, God gives you a gift. He doesn't take it away from you. You may choose never use it. And that's your fault. But if he gave you a gift, invest it. Remember the one with the five, the one with the two, and the one with the one talent? 
One with five got another five, and well done, good and faithful. One with the two got another two, well done, good and faithful, right? And the one with the one had a bad concept of God. God is harsh. God reaps what he does. I don't know what he's going to do, so I'm going to hide the money in the ground. Well, hiding the money in the ground is a type and shadow of you hiding your life under your flesh. Nobody gets to know the God in you because you cover it up with yourself. Hey, let God out once in a while. Well, yeah. Hey, God, can God come out and play? Come on. Don't shout me down. I'm preaching real good. Okay, now listen. All right. Then he said, verse, where did I stop? Verse 30. Right? For as you were once disobedient to God, you have now obtained mercy through their disobedience. Even though these also haven't now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown to you, they also may obtain mercy. Why is God blessing all those Gentile people? They're dogs. We're be God's chosen ones. And see, we're supposed to make, we're supposed to be so blessed, it makes Jewish people jealous. We're, and this is, I don't mean money. I mean so blessed with God. And they don't have that relationship with God. They just have a works program. Wave the flags at a certain time and hoot the boo and march upon the wall of the Hans is And it's all beautiful, but it's a work. And if you put faith in that work, God will show up. But if you just do the beautiful thing, it's just pretty on the outside, but dead on the inside. So let's go on past this. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Verse 35. Or who has first given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. In other words, it's all about God and his son. All the rest is just trivia. <laughs> Can you, a couple of questions. Number one, God through Christ accepts everyone, doesn't he? Who approaches him by faith and will show mercy on us. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Right? Two, even those who rejected the gospel, God will accept if they believe in Christ. There is no difference. We all came from the loin of Adam, didn't we? We all came from Noah, right? I don't care what red, yellow, black, and white, we are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the adults, children, and everything of the world, just not the sin nor the devil in it. All right, and then thirdly, God's plan is perfect. All the time, every time, he's perfect. So why would we want to do our, our way anyway? Sit down, get God's mind on it, and just ask him to help you step it through. How many have ever heard the term, you're just acting out your anger? Okay, you're just acting out, okay? Well, we have... God on the inside by. Let's act him out. You're filled with the Lord. Walk him out. And so it is written, walk out your own salvation with fear and trouble. And you're not going to walk it out by yourself. You're going to, you and the Lord are going to team up, yoke up. You're going to learn from him. And through life, you're going to become the best that you can be. Can you say Amen. And just as a joke, this pastor is going to keep the beatings until you become that way. No, I'm joking. God bless you. If you enjoyed the Bible study tonight, thank you for coming. Next week, guess what? Romans chapter 12, one of my favorites.